So today we are going to discuss a new advanced surface characterization technique. The name of the technique is Auger Electron Spectroscopy or in short it is known as AES. We have discussed about the SPS or X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy in details. So some of the concepts I will borrow from the XPS to the AES, but I will have to discuss many other new things in the advanced spectroscopic technique. Uh, so therefore, I need to constrain myself so that time does not come go out of order. So in RGS spectroscopy, uh, the basically the materials which I am going to use here are taken from different sources, but most notably this book is the source of the material for all the spectroscopic techniques in the Encyclopedia of Materials Characterization edited by Bundle Evans Wilson published by Butterworth Hinman, Boston in 1992. The schematic representation or the outline of the particular lecture series of on AES is as follows. First I will talk about some historical perspectives of Auger electron spectroscopy, how it has come about it. Then I need to discuss in detail about the basic principles and you must know very well that. Then there are certain nomenclatures which are used in AES like any other techniques. Then I will go to AES spectra, what is how would any spectra of AES, how does it look like, what are the information we can obtain from there. This will be followed by discussion on the other effects. There are many other effects and obviously some amount of instrumentations we need to discuss and in all this many examples will be given to show you how relevant this technique is for different applications in material science. So let me just start with the historical perspectives. As you know Auger electron spectroscopy is a very widely used technique for surface characterization of materials. It is used to know the electronic states of different elements present in the surface. It can be used to measure compositions of the different elements on the surface. This is a non-radiative deacceleration process unlike XPS where you are using an X-ray source to eject out a core level electron from an atom and that is how and then the electrons comes out from the material and measure the kinetic energy of the core level electron and do remaining other things. This is not like that. This is a non irritative de-excitation process. Remember this is not excitation process, it is de-excitation process, but this is also non radiative irradiative. That means we are not irradiating, we are not getting this phenomena because of irradiation like in XPS. This de-excitation occurs obviously by Coulomb interaction where an atom loses energy by emission of one or more electrons and then ejected electron to one continuum state is what is known as OGR. Obviously at the beginning definition will not be clear to you, uh, it needs to be discussed and needs to be you know uh, talked about it. I am going to do that in the basic principle stuff. But first is what discovered in 1923 by a lady named Leis Metner or Lee Metner basically her picture is shown here, these are all taken from different books. And after two years in 1925, this was independently discovered, it seems this was independently discovered by Pierre Augier and after his name this spectroscopy is coined. This is Pierre Victor Augier picture, you can see there. This paper by Augier was published in you know Journal of Physics Radium in 1925 and uh, he, I mean this, this process is named after him. To give you even how the developments took place later on, let me just talk in little detail. So therefore in 1923-25, the effect was discovered independently by Medner and Augier. Medner published his paper in Journal of 
Jet script for physics and uh, Augier published in Journal of Radium. Their pictures are shown here. But then there was a big lull, nothing happened because of obviously because of instrumentation problem. 1953, Jens Lander uses electrons to excited to create excited Auger electrons, and those Auger electrons are used to study the surface impurities. The problem are basically the vacuum system because you know these electrons which are created by Auger process are very low energy, so therefore vacuum has to be very good to detect them. And also obviously detection system needs to be developed. Then 1968, so that was 1953 by Lander and 1968 L. Harish demonstrates the usefulness of this technique when he differentiates the energy distribution of Auger electrons emitted from a bombarded surface. At the same time Weber and Peria employed lead optics as Auger spectrometers. Lead I have taught actually low energy electron diffraction this will be taught by my fellow colleague. So, lead actually is uh, uh, as called lead can be optics can be used for OGR for detection system that was done by Weber and Peria. Then 1969 Plumbers et al invent the cylindrical mirror analyzer or is known as CMA which greatly improved the speed and sensitivity of the technique. So, you can see from 1925 to 1970 almost like 35 years took to develop this technique to be useful. And then in mid 80s saw the real implementation of the this technique because of the short key filameters as electron source, short key filameters has a very high brightness this we discussed in the electron microscopy. So, this allows actually to analyze remember surface features size of 20 nanometers very small size. And then in fact afterwards 1990s even beginning of 1990s lot of implement happen in analyzing analyzers actually and sources this limit is now pushed to 10 nanometer regime. In fact to be frank this limit has pushed below 10 nanometer regime recently. So, that is how actually the whole the technique has been so uh, nicely developed, but we must give credit to Liz Medner and P. A. Augier for discovering this technique because this was a very fundamental technique which is used extensively in material science even till today. So, before I actually talk about Augier spectroscopy in detail, let me just tell you you know we know that any spectroscopic technique whether it is electron spectroscopy or X-ray spectroscopy or Augier spectroscopy it actually basically depends on the interaction of the radiation or the or the electron or x-ray or any other radiation with the material. And material means atoms, atom means nucleus and the nuc electrons. So, when ions electrons are photons they are all actually source of radiation this falls on the surface material any atom actually in the sense which is kept inside a vacuum it can cannot generate ions, electrons and photons. And if we analyze this which is generated because of this interaction process we can get a lot of information about the atom. That is the basic principle of any spectroscopic technique whether it is a electron angular spectroscopy or XPS or OGR. So, that means the an interaction between the surfaces of a material with the incoming high energy radiation source generating other radiation like ions, electrons or photons is what is the basic thing of spectroscopy. Well, to uh, you know talk about the Auger spectroscopy, we need to know little bit about the electronic structure. As you know electrons rotates around the nucleus in an atom in an atom. So, and these electrons have different energy levels and all we know that the energy level depends on their quantum numbers, the principal quantum numbers the that is S P D F, then you have magnetic quantum number L, then you have the azimuthal quantum number say azimuthal quantum number L, magnetic quantum number M and spin quantum number S. So, uh, depending on the energy levels we can actually split 
the electron energy levels in different cells like this one is shown K L N M. K cell has 1 s electrons that is the inner cell or core electron cell, L cell has 2 s or 2 p electrons, M cell has 3 s 3 p electrons. So, the binding energy of electron will increase as you go closer and closer to the core level. So, that means K level K s electrons will have more binding energies 10 m and so forth. And then you have a basically we have a basically uh, at, at the above the, the acquired cells you have uh, what is known as Fermi level and then you have vacuum. Now, we can actually demarcate these energy levels in two ways as you know in the x-ray nomenclature this one L uh, basically k is k. So, k is k this one s L 1 is known as 2 s L 2 p is known as L 2 3 M 1 is known as a 3 actually 3 s corresponds to M 2 3 corresponds to 3 p and then you have 3 d 3 3 4 s and 4 p levels and above. That is why actually x ray you know people use the nomenclature and this is atomic nomenclature x p s we have used another kind of nomenclature. Now, if I consider the electronic structure of a metal like sodium, what it has? Sodium has two electrons in 1 s level, two electrons in, in the 2 s level, then you have six electrons in 2 p levels correct. So, that, that means K L 1, L 2, 3 these are the energy levels created. So, in a solid state the core levels of atoms are little perturbed and essentially remain as a discrete localized levels that we know. And this is this the valence orbitals have a whole lap sometimes significantly with those of the neighboring atoms genetic bands of specially decolized delocalized energy levels. So, after knowing this now let us talk about the physical basis of OGS spectroscopy. What is the physical basis of this particular technique? Well, I think I talked about XPS. Let me just bring in uh, the XPS concept. And uh, what happens in the XPS concept is we have X ray source, which is a high energy X ray source. It is allowed to fall on a sample, and this high energy X rays then basically interact with the electrons, core electrons of the atom, and eject the core electrons of the atoms leaving behind a hole there. So, then once it leaves behind a hole and the ejected electron goes out and the we are analyzed the ejected electron energy levels or kinetic energies and that is how we actually uh, do the analysis. So, if I have to uh, show it very nicely I can just show it on the board. Let us suppose we have K level this is K, this is L and this is M. Right. And then you have E f there is a Fermi level and you have then vacuum E vac that is how the energy diagram of a atom can be represented. Now, if I have certain radiation like X ray photon falls on this K level electrons and what will happen? This because of this, this electrons some amount of this electron because of this X ray photon this electron the K level will be ejected out. And then this passes through because this is like very high kinetic energy normally the incident beam will have very high energy, energy higher than almost 10 times higher than the kinetic uh, the binding energy of this electron in the K level. Because of this excess energy of the incident X ray, the ejected electron will have lot of kinetic energy and because of this high kinetic energy this electron will go out and that is what we do measure in the XPS. So, this is what is used in the XPS as you know I have discussed that. This is irradiative process and uh, this is also kind of leads to create a hole in the K level. Now, let us discuss what happens in OGM. 
So, I draw the same thing here again. So, I have k level electrons L cells and then you have M cells and then you have so k L M and then you back right. So, now I have already created a hole in the k level electron because of this radiation. So, what will happen this an atom is now in a excited state because or ionized basically this is an ionized atom because one electron has gone out. So, because of that it has one uh, you know because of this um, high energy state. So, what is what this atom can do to come uh, you know to a lower its energy some higher level electrons uh, can jump suppose this level electron L 1 here can jump into the this hole or can jump to the k level hole and fill this space. And if it does so what will happen? If it does so this electron has jumped and fill the space. So, now what will happen because of this difference energies between the L and k some amount of x rays will be coming out and this x rays which will come out can eject out another electrons from the higher levels like m or l m level or whatever or maybe higher level and this is what is called augia electrons and this is what is known as augia process. So, that means basically what is done here is as follows which can be seen from this picture very carefully what I have drawn here and what I am showing in the slide is similar. So, because you have a hole created in the k level as the electron has gone out. So, one electron from the L 1 level will jump and fill the two hole and because of this there will be some energy released and this energy can then eject out electron from suppose L 2 3 cell and this is what is known as OJ electrons. So, in a nutshell I can say ionized atom that remains after the removal of the core hole electron is of course, a highly excited state and will therefore, will like to rapidly relax back to the lower energy state and it can do by two routes as you say one is known as x ray flow sense route other one is OGR emission route. Let us consider because we are not talking about x ray flow sense here that is a separate thing we will consider only OGR. So, as you say here the this is what is the OGR source. So, therefore, a rough estimate of the kinetic energy of this OGR electron can be done by knowing the binding, binding energies of the various levels. So, kinetic energy is basically E k minus L 1 that is what is the jump minus L 2 3 this is was the difference which has created the energy and then this is the binding energy of the electron the L 2 3 cell. So, therefore, basically E k minus E L 1 plus E 2 3 the kinetic energy was electron is independent of the mechanism of initial hole creation this is very important initial hole creation can be anything basically OGR process uses electrons electron beams to create the hole not the x rays. So, basically it is very clear that the kinetic energy of this OG electron is independent of whatever the process is used to create the hole in the inner shell or the core level core cells. So, normally uh, in XPS normally what is done is that you know the, to in practice we use a very high energy incident beam and the electrons like uh, of the order of 5 will be 5 to 10 kilo electron volts. So, holes will be produced by this electrons or it can be produced by even backscatter electrons also. So, that how I I hope the now that these two processes the difference between these two processes are clear to you. So, the because of the creation of this OG electrons is totally different from the XPS the energy of the OG electron is also very small because it is very small energy is much small as compared to the XPS electrons. So, the information which we can gather will be from very small depth of the surface of the material. So, date to give you in much detailed perspectives let us do it again. So, higher the electron beam comes 
suppose this is the ground state of the electron k level L 1, L 2, 3 and then above higher energy electrons it can be also photons, but normally we do not use any photons we use electrons and it rejects the electrons from the core level or k level leaves behind a hole this is what is ionized electron. So, one electrons then falls from the L 1 level to fill this k 1 level because of this some energy released and this energy then eject out L 2 3 level electrons and the electron gets transported this is what is in an actual whole OGR process and this is what is shown here here z plus h nu this is z is the atomic number of the material suppose h omega is the energy of the electron z a plus electron level and z a plus electron level produces whenever OGR electron it will be z l b c plus electron plus electron a that is what is the electron a that is OGR electron. So, if you use a conservation law E b a E b a is energy of the material is basically n 1 minus n of the two final state and the initial state n 1 is n is the number of electrons E k a that is the OGR A b c A b c is the three processes A is the beginning process B actually intermediate process and C minus u e is basically the, the energy to remove the electron this is there. So, OJ electron energy is independent of the excitation energy as I have told you, U is known as the OJ parameter, OJ parameter is the machine dependent parameter. So, what are the nomenclatures? This is what is shown here in the whole process. Well, nomenclatures are very complex in a SPS, I, I need to discuss in detail about that. The XPS nomenclatures are basically like 2 s, 2 p half, 2 p 3 by 2 you know half is basically 1 minus half and 3 by 2 is 1 plus half and 1 stands for, stands for p a s s now the s basically stands for 0 and then if you use l l will be corresponding to 2. So, 2 minus half is 3 by 2 or 2 plus half is 5 by 2 this we have seen. So, what happens in s in an in, in OGR as you see here in this case source comes keeps a hole this comes down and then electron goes up that is what is shown. So, in x ray in, in OGR we use x ray nomenclature. So, what is this x ray nomenclature conventionally used nomenclature is x ray type in OGR so, suppose for example, k l 1 l 2 3 that is what is here happened k l 1 l 2 3 this is a whole transition. When electronic levels are energetically well distinguishable it is common to use most sub, sub indices like L 1 2 3 M 2 3 M 4 5 this also one can use uh, very well distinguished atoms can be done that. For a group of transitions sub indices are in many times omitted like K L L K M M M B B or for transitions involving levels in the valence band commonly used V uh, instead L M N O P for example, M 4 by 5 V V. So, but normally we use this or this other things are not extensively used. Let me just discuss in detail about a table and to show you so that you do not forget. So, basic nomenclature which is used in the SPS can be written like this. Suppose, this is quantum number this is quantum number and this is suppose notation. So, we are going to notations both x p s and x ray and that is what is used in a e s right. So, quantum number means n l and j right. So, this is what we are going to do. So, let us suppose for point number n equal to 1, l equal to 0 and j equal to half, l is the azimuthal quantum number and j is the spin quantum number here you can use instead of j let us use s spin quantum number. So, and then we use basically what we use 1 s half this is just 1 s there is no need of writing. In x ray we use this as a k. So, if it is 2 quantum number this becomes 0 and this becomes half. So, and what is this x p s we use this we use 2 s half right 
and this is corresponding in x ray is L1. So, if you suppose 2 again quantum number 2 and 1 and half here, so this will be 2s, 2s not 2p half basically because 2 L is 1, 2 p half and this will be L 2 I guess, yes L 2 and then if we use 2, 1, 1, 3 by 2, 3 by 2 is 1 plus half 3 by 2, this will be 2 p 3 by 2. This is what we have discussed, how 2 p half and 2 p 3 by 2 comes in next space I have discussed and this will be L 3, right. Now, let us do something for 3 actually. When principal quantum I come 3, this is 0, this is half, this will be what? This will be 3 p 3 s sorry 3 s half and this will be m 1. So, if it is become 3 1 and half, so this will be 3 p 5 by 2 half half 3, 5, 3 half. So, 3 p half and this will be m m 2 and last one let me see 3 1 3 by 2 3 1 3 by 2 will be p 3 by 2 3 p 3 by 2 this will be m 3 right and so on. So, as you see here k stands for 1 s half l 1 stands for 2 s half l 2 stands for 2 p half l 3 stands for 2 p 3 by 2 m 1 stands for 3 s half m 2 stands for 3 p 2 by 2 and m 3 stands for 3 p 3 by 3 t by 2. And this 3 by 2 basically comes because of spin j, j plus l, l is suppose 1 here. So, it becomes 1 plus half is 3 by 2. Okay, so, that is how it comes. So, basically in XPS we use these notations to demarcate different peaks. On the other hand in OGR we use these notations. This is funny because these two techniques are same spectroscopic techniques actually, but we use different different notations for the speaks, uh, you know transitions. So, that means if there is a transition form suppose like this one k l 1 l 2 3, l 2 3 is 2 3 levels. So, it will be k l 1 l 2 3 or k l l both are possible. If there is transition form k suppose l 1 m 1 then it will be k l 1 m 1 or k l m or k m m is also possible ok all these things are possible different kinds of combinations are possible. Well to give you in a better perspective, so what is the difference between this photo electron and OG spectroscopy will be clear from here. Well as you see here 1 s 2 s 2 p this is energy level of an atom or the different electron energy levels basically then you have a Fermi level quantum band quantum bands and the vacuum and the free electrons. So, you have a incident x ray with energy k nu falls on it, it creates it removes and core level electrons, this core level electron goes out. So, that means the current energy of electron will be h nu minus binding energy of this electron minus phi specification is basically specification is basically because of the machine, but in a OGM what is happening you have created a hole because of this hole the electrons from the L 2 3 jumps and then emitted x ray comes out. This x ray is then generate or ejects out another electron from this L 2 L 3 cells and this electrons is known as OGM. So, uh, the kinetic energies obviously is will be depending on k L 1 and L 2 3 and that is how we have calculated in the early also. Now, next thing you should discuss is what is the OGS signal or what is basically OGS, how does the OGS spectra look, spectrum look like. In general initial ionization is non selective, because initial ionization means how the hole in the k level is created is non selective. And initial hole may therefore, be in various shells like k cell, l cell, m cell, any shells, because that depends on the how the initial ionization has taken place. And then there will be many many OGS transition possible for a given element, some will be very weak, 
sun will be strong. So, RGS spectroscopy is basically based upon the measurement of the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons of the RGA, RGA electrons. So, each element in a sample being studied will give rise to characteristic spectrum peaks of various kinetic energies. So, that is how RGS spectrum is basically uh, will contain large number of peaks and uh, you know that creates many times a problem. To give an example, let us suppose, let us take the RGS spectrum of palladium metal, palladium has a very large number of electrons in the, in the, in the, in the elect outer cells or even inner cells and this is generated by 2.5 kV electron beam to produce initial core electron vacancies and hence to stimulate the RGR emission process. The main peaks of the palladium occurs between 220 to 340 electron volts. The peaks are situated between you know between basically on a high background that is why the problem in RGR. This mainly because of the secondary electrons are generated by multitude of inelastic scattering processes. So, RGS spectra are often shown in different state form that is why and the reason for this is partially historical partially because it is possible to actually measure the spectra directly in this form and doing so get a better sensitivity of the detector detection actually. The plot actually shows a sun spectrum this is the signal versus Ke. You can see here there is a high background because of the secondary electron and these are the peaks which are coming out which are between 220 and 340. But whenever we take a differentiate of the selected signal with respect to uh, the uh, energy level d n by d we get a smoother background and the peaks can be seen very nicely. That is what is normally used in OGR. This one is not used in OGR. Well, to give you a much better idea, this is a plot between D and E versus D E uh, with respect to electron and this is basically from the silver. As you see here, this is N E of silver, this is energy level electrons, this is the N E for 10 and then this is D N E by E. Signals are much stronger when you plot D N E by D E versus energy levels. That is why we use all this. Now, to tell let you give you some examples of these or just transition lines, I have already discussed you different transitions. Let us do it for uh, I think certain example this is taken from a MTech thesis, MSc thesis of University of Campinas long back. If you look at that on this plot you have intensity versus kinetic energy of indium element helium, indium, you have both your XPS peaks which are here and OGR peaks which are here. OGS will have less energy than the XPS, less than 3400 or less than 3500 actually, EV is the energies of the of this OGR and higher than 3600 basically from 3S, 3P and 3D electron levels of the. This was done with the excitation with the titanium K alpha which has energy of 4511 electron volts. So, what do you see? We see all the tension like LMM, LMN transition. India has a large number of electrons. So, therefore, there will be large number of OGA transitions possible. So, the ones which are basically uh, very you know routine is L1, M45, M45, M45 is M45 from M45 and all others L2, M45, M45 again L3, L3 also they are from L3 to M transitions, M M transition. Uh, then this are actually call all L M N transitions. There are different different element transition L1 to L4 M45 N45, and then L1 to M45 M45 L3 L2, and so on. So basically, these are all M L M M transitions as you see here, and there are many, and there is only two. This is the one LMN, this is another one LMN, this is also LMM transitions. And uh, these transitions actually can be detected very nicely in a um, XPS spectrum. Here, although it is plotting DNA uh, intensity or whatever energy coming out from the electrons, but many times if you plot DNA versus DE versus kinetic energy, DNA by DA is what is plot, the slope of this curve basically, that will give you much better peaks. So, for a given elements, several lines of OGR will be observed or seen. That is what is observed. 
So, Auger transition lines for different elements can be plotted like this. This is atomic number versus electron energy and the different elements starting from lithium to uranium correct. So, what you see here basically K L L transition, K L M M transition, M M M transitions and so on red dots actually indicates the most intense lines which are seen in the spectrum. So, I could see here we can observe K L L transition till sulfur as you can see here because energy levels are small uh, the atomic numbers are small so therefore, this in, as you go on we can observe seeing L M M transitions from atomic number about uh, 12 to atomic number about 40 and then M M M transitions since at higher atomic number starting from 37 to about 84, 85 and then so on you can observe actually M uh, and higher level transitions like this ones for very high atomic number elements. So, this is this is very important because this table tells you what all transition you can expect when you are doing the OGR measurements. I think uh, last one today's class today's lecture I am going to show you is the analysis volume. As you so know that when a certain energy source is falling on the sample material it interacts with the material and it creates a volume of interaction or interaction volume rather. So, the x rays comes out from a large volume, then comes out the this actually cattery x rays as you see here, which higher than atomic number 4. A backscatter electron also comes out, secondary electron comes out from a mass level. Auger electrons comes out only from 4 to 5, 50 Armstrong. This is the depth from which it can come out, very small. Depending on the spot size of the electron gun, it is possible to have spatial resolution, very small spatial resolution. In the direction perpendicular to the surface, the analysis volume depends on the electron mean phi path. So, mean phi path versus electron energy, if you plot, if you see a mean phi path basically, first it decreases from gold to uh, you know bottom to beryllium, then it increases till sodium. So, this is what is the this was the main factor was the beam size, other one is the mean phi path. So, if you use a perpendicular measurement system here like that, then your mean phi path becomes very important. 